Remember, don't ask for the task to be easy. Just ask for it to be worth it. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't ask for less challenge. Ask for more skills. Don't ask for less problems. Ask for more wisdom. It's the challenge that makes the experience. And life and its color and meaning and adventure for you is this collection of experiences. To wish them away is to wish your life away. First of all, let's define worry. There are many ways we could describe it. Worry is fear painting pictures in your mind. And if you watch that mental movie too long, you get a false picture of how things really are. Worry is a mental broadcasting station, and more often than not, it is false or at least distorted propaganda. Worry has that sneaky way of stopping short of giving you all the facts. Worry is often the trickery of mentally filtered facts on the negative side and the bold declaration that these are all the facts. Worry has the mental audacity to suggest that the elevator only runs one way, down. Many times worry is a five-alarm bell for a wastebasket fire. And worry is a depletion of constructive emotion. It's wasted mental energy. It's like letting the starter run the battery down when the car won't start. And worry is most often a lack of all the facts, a lack of full understanding, a lack of total information, and an unpreparedness of ability, knowledge, talent, courage, faith, and all the other virtues. That should give us a better definition of worry, and remember, left unchecked, it can become like a mad dog loose in the house, and the sorrow and pain and regret is too large a price to pay not to do something about it, and to do it now. You see, if you contemplated the total sum of human suffering long enough, it would drive you mad. You must understand how life is, Human suffering, man's inhumanity to man, war, disease, poverty. But it must be in what I call its rightful ratio of your mental and emotional time. So much for what worry is. The next question is, what can I do about it? What is the first step? My best advice on this is to first recognize worry for what it is. Admit what it does, and then decide you now want to be free. It first starts with decision on your part. And may I add, well, you should decide. Why let worry continue to take money out of your pocket and bank account? Why let worry any longer keep you from becoming all you can be? Why let it rob you of better friendships, better business, better profits, better results, better communication, better family relations? Why impose your worry on others any longer? It's a burden you can get rid of and a monkey you can get off your back. Why not be rid of those sinking, nagging feelings that all is not going to be well, that you can't do it, that it won't work out for the best? Worry is undue concern that takes up too much of your mental and emotional time. Now we must all be concerned. Hey, life is no joke except to the jokers. Life and how to live it is a serious matter. It is risky, full of peril, and there are constant threats to the good we want and to the pursuit of happiness. However, it is undue concern, or concern that takes up too much mental time that begins the harm. It's like a family planning a wonderful trip. While they certainly should be concerned about the condition of the car, the tires, and making sure they pick the proper route, it would be foolish to allow themselves to be completely turned negative with the thought that they might crash and kill the entire family. If that were the case, even if they went, the entire trip would be turned into one nightmare of fear with the specter of chaos looming around every curve rather than enjoying the wonderful trip they had planned for themselves and their family. A lot of people do that with their entire life. So, start to make these declarations. And if you mean it, 
they will start you on your way to confidence and adventure free of the worry habit. Say first, I've had it with worry. I'm tired of being beaten down and hassled with all those negative mental pictures. I refuse to be tricked by false facts. I'm really not that weak. Never again do I want those sick feelings inside, those mental false alarms. I'm tired of the drain on my resources. I'm tired of the embarrassment of the lack of confidence. I don't want people, especially my family, to see me in this state anymore. I've got more to offer. I refuse to let my life be short-circuited any longer by letting my mind run wild with a distorted view of the facts, whether I bring it up or if it comes from someone else. Prove it to yourself. Think back over all the things that you worried about, all the fantastic catastrophic events that your well-meaning advisors had told you were going to happen. Be pleased that none of them ever happened to you, or else you would not be alive today. Ninety percent of the things you worry about never happen anyway. All of us have had these well-meaning advisors who want to appear larger in the eyes of those they wish to advise, and who immediately rear back and describe every single bad option they can think of that might possibly happen. By the time they have finished, the one who has come for some confidence and some help wonders why he even bothers to live anymore. And the fact is, those things are never really going to happen anyway. Bring to question now what your mind tells you or what others tell you and pledge not to go for false alarms. I've had it is a good beginning. This first step will start you arguing with your worry thoughts. Soon you will start to examine your fears and worries to see if they are valid, and you won't let your mind play those mental tricks any longer. You know, I've heard a lot of experts say that fear isn't real. That is such a bunch of baloney. Fear is so real. In fact, there are probably things that you're afraid of doing right now in your life, in your relationships, at work. And the fact that you're afraid, that's robbing you of all of the experiences that you want to have in your life. I mean, if you're afraid to fly, that's going to limit your ability to travel and see the world or go visit friends. If you're afraid of public speaking, that's going to really limit your ability to express yourself and share your ideas. If you're afraid of talking to your boss or asking for a raise, that directly impacts how much money you make. Or what if you are dreaming of starting a business or you've already started a new business, but you're afraid to talk to people and you're afraid to share your business with people. I mean, fear is something that stops us all. And that's why I'm here to talk to you because it doesn't have to. Fear is real, but I am going to share a secret weapon that I have used for years to beat every single fear that used to stop me. Now, first, before we get into this secret weapon, I just want to cover a few facts about fear, what it is, what it isn't, and some things that you may not know about fear. So first thing, fear is a physical state in your body that is exactly the same as excitement. Let me say that again. Fear and excitement are the exact same physical state. Your heart races. You might sweat a little bit. You might feel tightening in your chest. You might feel a pit in your stomach. Uh, you have a surge of cortisol. It's basically the way that your body goes into a hyper aware state because it's readying for action. Now, what's the difference between fear and excitement? Really simple. The only difference between fear and excitement is what your brain is doing as your body is all agitated. If you're excited, your brain's going, oh, wow, this is going to be so cool to ride this roller coaster. If you're afraid, your brain's going, oh, uh, uh, no way. There's no way I'm doing that. This is dangerous. Get out of there. Don't do that. It's saying something different. So what's critical about understanding this is that we're going to use the fact that your mind is either working for you for excitement or against you with fear 
to your advantage. And I'll tell you about it in just a minute, how you're going to do that. Second thing I want you to understand is that you may have heard the advice, feel the fear and do it anyway. You may have heard the advice, oh, just try to calm down. Think positive thoughts. It doesn't work, does it? And there's a reason why it doesn't work. So let's go back to fact number one. When you're afraid your body's in a state of arousal and agitation and your heart is racing and you're all like amped up and you're hyper aware of what's going on and you're freaking out a little bit. What is it like when you're calm? <sighs> you just kind of chill, right? You got like this low arousal state. Very, very difficult to go from a state of agitation and being all jacked up and excited and weirded out and, uh, to a ah kind of state. It doesn't work. It's like trying to stop a train by throwing a boulder on the tracks. It's going to make the train jump off the tracks. It's going to cause a disaster. In fact, they've proven in research that when you try to ignore your fears, it actually makes them worse. And they've also proven in research that positive thinking alone also can make your fears work worse. So what do you do? What do you do when you're about to go talk to your boss and you feel afraid? What do you do when you have to get on a plane and you're actually terrified of flying? What do you do if you got to give a presentation and you are afraid of public speaking? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to use a strategy, the same one that I use, that has helped me beat every single fear and turned me into somebody that is terrific when it comes to a high stress situation. This is how you do it. You're going to use my five second rule in combination with what I call an anchor thought. And that is going to reframe what your mind is doing so that your mind goes from feeling agitation and making you afraid to reframing it from agitation to excitement. It works like magic. Now I want to give you one more example just to make sure that you really get how you can use this. So a lot of you have written to me about your fear of flying. And I can really relate to that fear because I used to have the exact same fear. But I use this same strategy to conquer it. Here's how you're going to do it. So first things first, if you've got to do something that really makes you nervous or that you're afraid to do, before you're about to do it, come up with an anchor thought. What's an anchor thought? Well, an anchor thought is something that's going to anchor you so that you don't escalate any situation into a full-blown panic attack or into a situation where you screw things up. It's a way for you to anchor yourself so you maintain control over what you're thinking and how you behave. So here's an example with flying. It's important when you're creating an anchor thought to pick something that is in the proper context of what you're afraid to do. So for flying, pick an anchor thought that has to do with the trip that you're taking. So if I'm boarding a plane to fly back home to Michigan, an anchor thought might be, a picture in my mind of my mom and I walking on the shores of Lake Michigan where I grew up. That's a thought that makes me happy. It makes me excited. And it's also related to the trip that I'm taking. If you have a conversation that you need to have with your boss, pick an anchor thought about how you feel after having that conversation. Maybe it's you picking up the phone and calling somebody that you, you love and saying, oh my
gosh, it went so well. Or, you know, you walking out of the meeting and feeling like, yeah, I survived that conversation. I feel pretty good about myself. So now that you have your anchor thought, you're ready to beat the fear. How you're going to do it is this. So let's go back to the example of the plane. I'm on the plane. I'm flying to Michigan. We hit turbulence. My body's going to start getting agitated, right? I'm starting to get nervous. My heart starts to race. One of two things can happen. I can't control how my body might feel, but I can always, always control what I'm thinking about. And I can always control how I act. And so can you. So when I'm on a plane and the turbulence hits five, four, three, two, one, that's step one. And it's essential. And the reason why using the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one is essential is because that is how you switch the gears in your mind. You awaken your prefrontal cortex and you trigger your brain that you're now in control of your thoughts. You've interrupted the fear. You've settled your thoughts and now your brain is ready for that anchor thought. So then what I do after I go five, four, three, two, one is I insert the anchor thought that I've already come up with before the flight. I start thinking about walking on the beach and being with my mom and my dad. And I start telling myself, I'm so excited to walk on the shores of Lake Michigan. I'm so excited to see my parents. Now something remarkable is going to happen in your brain because you've interrupted the fear. And because you've used the five second rule to assert control and awaken your prefrontal cortex, and because you have an image that contextually makes sense to your brain, because you're flying to Michigan, you know what your brain does? Your brain goes, huh, Mel's excited to go to Michigan because my body is in a state. Remember the first fact, fear and excitement, exact same thing. What's the difference between fear and excitement? What your brain is saying, using the five second rule and an anchor thought, you can actually switch the gears in your mind and reframe the thoughts of fear into thoughts of excitement. And because you have a vision that makes sense based on what you're doing, your brain buys it. You just tricked your brain. Negative imagination is thinking about things we don't want to happen that cause enormous amount, enormous amounts of stress and distress. We say worry creates fear which can be described as fantasized experiences appearing real. Fantasized experiences appearing real because here, here's some of the discoveries that they've done with regard to worry. Worry is a sustained form of fear caused by indecision. It's a sustained form of fear caused by indecision. In other words, you're not in, you're not out. You do it, you don't do it. And so the only real cure for worry is decisive action. Get busy, take action, move forward. You see, the mind can only hold one thing at a time positive or negative, if you get so busy working on your situation, you don't have time to worry anymore. So a study was done on the things that people worry about. 40% of the worries people had never happened. 30% of the things were in the past for which nothing could be done. 12% were needless worries about health. And 10% were petty worries about little things that I parked the car right, that I, you know, leave my stuff in the car, that I bring everything from for the seminar. Uh, only 8% of the worries were about something substantial, and of those, 4% were out of their control. So basically what we find is that 96% of what you worry about is a waste of emotion. There's a businessman who never worried about anything, and they uh, said, why don't you worry? He said, I do worry. They said, I worry for one hour every Saturday morning. And what I do during the week is when I think of something that I'm worried about, I write it on a piece of paper, and I put it into this box. And then I don't think about it till Saturday morning at nine o'clock on Saturday morning, I go and get out the box and I just go through all the things I was supposed to worry about during the week. And surprise, surprise, by Saturday morning, 80, 90 percent of them have disappeared. <laughs> so he says, I'm going to worry, just not now. I'm just going to worry. I'm going to have a worry time on Saturday morning. And as a result, it never ends up worrying. And you should do the same thing. Just take a little box or an envelope. Whenever you think of something you're worried about, write it on the envelope and say, I'll have worry time on that later. But you'll notice if you get really busy, you forget to worry. You can be busy all day long and you forget to worry all day long. You think, oh my God, it's five o'clock. I haven't worried about that all day. So to eliminate worry, live one day at a time. That's one of the great rules. Live one day at a time. Get the facts. Before you start worrying, there's a rule that says, just for today, I will remain calm. Just for today, I will not think about the things that make me upset. Just for today. 
and anybody can live one day at a time. In Dale Carnegie's famous book, How to Start, Start, Stop Worrying and Start Living, the very first day, he talks about living in daytight compartments, the very first chapter, he says, the key to not worrying is to live one day at a time. And don't worry about things that may happen in the distant future. Uh, in the Bible, it said, sufficient unto the day are the cares thereof. So just be concerned about what's happening. today, which is under your control. The second is to get the facts. Many times we get upset or angry about something because, or we worry about something because we don't have the facts. We have a half fact or we have a partial fact. And so the first thing you do is ask what exactly has happened. And you ask questions. And how has this happened? And what is the situation? And what's going on? And you find it is impossible to worry while you're asking questions and trying to get more information. So you focus on asking questions, and you ask several people what has happened here until you have a very clear idea, and very often you'll find there's nothing to worry about. Very often you'll find that what you thought you needed to be concerned about is really not a problem at all. In fact, you may have even had the wrong facts when you started worrying about it. The third thing you can do is use the worry buster technique. Now, the worry buster technique is one of the greatest techniques ever discovered. It's a life changer. It changes people's thinking forever. It's certainly been very helpful to me. You define the worry situation clearly in writing. So let us say that you're having severe financial problems. Then write down clearly, my problem is that I need X number of dollars by May 31st, and I only have X number of dollars, so I'm this many dollars short. In other words, get clarity about the worry situation. Many people are worried about something, but it's very vague and turbulent in the back of their mind. So when you're forced to think on paper, Think on paper, think on paper. 50% of all worries are cured when you write down what you're worried about in the first place. If you're working with other people 
and you have three or four people in a discussion and you're all worried about something, you say, all right, exactly what it is, what is it that we are worried about? All four will have a different definition. So all four of you are trying to solve a problem situation, and but none of you are really clear about what it is until you write it down. Once everybody agrees with the definition, often the solution just pops up. The second thing that you do with the worry buster is determine the worst possible outcome of the situation. We call this the WPO, worst possible outcome. What is the worst thing that can possibly happen as a result of this worry situation? And whatever it is, you say, well, it's something you can live with. If that's the worst possible thing that can happen, no matter what, well, then what you do is you say, all right, well, if that happens, it happens. And so number three is you resolve to accept the worst should it occur. We run out of money by the end of the month, or I could die from an incurable illness, or the house will burn to the ground or something else. So you say, okay, if it does happen, then I will accept it. And it's interesting, resistance to a negative situation is the major cause of stress. Once you say, okay, if it happens, it happens. The interesting thing is it's like deflating a balloon, is once you resolve to accept the worst, all the tension goes away. You don't have any tension and your mind clears and goes calm. Okay, the business goes broke, it won't kill me. If the house burns down, we get another house. If they lose all our money, we lose all our money. In other words, just accept it. And then, number four, begin immediately to improve upon the worst. They teach this, by the way, in the universities. They call it the mini-max regret analysis. They say minimize the maximum possible regret. And so business people are taught when they make a decision is to say, what is the worst thing that can possibly happen here and how can we minimize the maximum? How can we minimize the very worst thing? So the worry buster is very powerful. Whenever you find yourself worried, say, wait a minute, what am I worried about? What's the worst possible outcome? What's the WPO here? And if you want to help other people, there's a wonderful observation. We say you become what you think about, you also become what you teach. And one of the fastest ways to internalize these ideas so that you think this way is to teach other people. When they have a con situation of concern, say exactly what it is, what is it that you are worried about? And then what's the worst that could possibly happen? And so if that were to happen, would it kill you? If the answer is no, so what could you do to improve upon the worst? So begin immediately to improve upon the worst. And sometimes by simply facing it squarely, you can solve the worry situation quickly. All right, worry is a form of negative goal setting. It's setting goals for things that you absolutely don't want to happen. So if you're really worried about something, actually you're setting up a force field of energy to attract that into your life. There are some people who seem to always have bad luck. They seem to always have difficulties in their lives. But when you talk to them for five minutes, you know why. Because that's all they talk about. All they think about is possible negative things that could happen. Or negative things that have already happened that they can't do anything about, which they just keep rehashing. Worry is a sustained form of fear caused by indecision. One of the most powerful techniques which we've talked about is decisiveness. And the only real antidote to worry is purposeful action. So what I want you to do is use the law of substitution. Law of substitution says get so busy working on your goals that you don't have time to worry. And the interesting thing is that if you get so busy working on a goal, minimizing the worst that can happen, soon you reach the point where you just don't worry anymore. Remember, worry is something you probably learned from a parent. One of your parents taught you to worry because they worried all the time. And they worried about little things and big things and little things and big things. And you grew up with a worldview that worried is what you do when you're an adult. And the other thing is the higher your self-esteem, the more you like yourself, the less you worry about things. People who worry about things think that if something goes wrong, it's a reflection on them. Something fails or it doesn't work out, and you just have to say no. If things just don't work out, it's not a reflection on you. Just because you fail when you try something, which is much better than trying nothing, doesn't mean that you're a failure, it means that you're a learner. One last point with regard to worry or negativity of any kind. Vince Lombardi once wrote these wonderful words. He said, fatigue doth make cowards of us all. And if we get really tired or worn out, especially physically tired or emotionally tired because we're in an emotionally stressful situation, and you get worn out, everything becomes exaggerated. You become more worried about small worries. You become angrier about small irritations. You become more depressed about reversals. You uh, become fatalistic and think about quitting. 
So sometimes the very best thing you can possibly do is to just shut it all off and get a good night's sleep. Just go to bed early and just get a good night's sleep and just sleep eight or nine or 10 or 12 hours. Everybody's had the experience where they just say, I don't have to get up tomorrow morning. I'm just going to sleep until I can't sleep anymore. You sleep 10 hours and you can hardly believe it. And then all of those things that were bothering you the day before, well, they weren't really that important. So, so, so sometimes it's really important to get lots and lots of rest. Jewish religion, there's what is called a Sabbath. And it's been one of my favorite concepts for years. There was a wonderful book written on it by a Jewish scholar about the Sabbath. And a Sabbath is they stop work at 6 o'clock on Friday, and then they take all of Saturday is the Sabbath, and they don't do anything. They don't work. They don't catch up on their books. They don't even do anything intense. They just relax, spend time with the family, maybe even go for a walk, um, go to a movie, and so on. And it keeps going for 36 hours. It goes till 6 o'clock Sunday morning. And so that, what that means is you get two really good sleeps. And you'll find that if after that 36 hours, the whole world looks different. You're much more relaxed. You're more positive. You see more possibilities. You're more creative. You see things that you can do. You have the energy to take actions and, and so on. So sometimes if you get really tired or if you get burned out emotionally because of a stressful situation, the smartest thing you can do is nothing. Just relax. Just back off and get lots and lots of sleep. It really helps you.